So, um, first of all, <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here today, and thank you very much for your uh, very enthusiastic response that we've had. This has been the third themed meeting on the Internet of Things. It started out with a general introduction to the process at NTU back in July last year. <coughs> there was quite a few of you who probably came along to the cloud services lecture that was then in September. That was held over at Loughborough University. And we had some excellent speakers talking about a lot of things now that I can't remember. But some really good, really good ways of setting up really good ways of setting up cloud services that are probably already changed by now anyway. And so one of the things, because LATI is a grouping of particularly high-tech companies, there's a lot of people here that make electronics for other people, like Datalink, Michael Belcher here, uh, Martin to some extent, although self-developed as well, companies like ours, that we have to connect things. So we thought to actually take the theme a little bit further, we, we'd actually uh, look at the hardware that actually makes it a reality to get things into the internet. So uh, that's what we're doing here today. Um, my career goes back to the dark ages before we had an internet. And um, I actually started my career at MPL. And it was quite strange because it was a bit ahead of its time in that um, we had a network there with about 500 terminals connected to it and also about eight different computers. Um, that bit sounds good. What doesn't sound so good uh, is that the oldest computer there was connected up on a 300 bowed connection and you'd actually have your VDU and it would be like watching the pause results come in as it went across the screen. And I, I did some sums, I'm not totally sure if I'm right, but um, the uh, working on that, the uh, MP3 files, about 44 kilohertz, require about 1.4 million bits a second so I worked out that at 300 bowed, it's about 5,000 times too slow to stream an MP3 file. <laughs> and now we just do that on our phone without thinking about it. And although it was a long time ago, it, it was within living memory. So uh, it just gives an idea of you know, how things have changed, things that then would have been absolutely unimaginable, both at the speed and the storage that was available, and, and of course the cost of all that. It was, um, that network was called BS4421, and it was a proper packet switch network. I shouldn't think, there's anybody in the room ever heard of it? Probably not, I thought that would be the case. It actually was copied largely by um, Hewlett Packard to make their HPIB interface, which I'm sure there's probably a few of you that know that one. So, uh, that's that. So how things have moved on, I can remember spending many a happy day trying to make an RS-232 cable that connected two things together. Um, it was probably the most non-standard standard in the world with null modem cables and terminal cables and whatever. And it was a real job to get two things talking, even at 300 bode. And yesterday or, or the, earlier this week, I bought myself a network range extender and I plugged it into the socket. I went to my router and pushed the button, and that started flashing. I came back, pushed the button on that, and within less than a minute, it was all working. And I had internet upstairs, and I thought, wow, that's so different from my experience of working with RS-232 cables back in the dark ages then. And I guess they're the kind of devices that we're talking about today. The clever things that people have done with Wi-Fi, and how they enable us to access the internet and all of that. 